Welcome, everybody. My name is Scott Shaw. I'm the head of technology for ThoughtWorks here in Australia, and I'm going to MC this session. Um, and I uh, will be introducing Sarah in a second. Just one um, housekeeping note. Uh, we, if you have questions, please put them in the queue. You'll see a little Q&A uh, button down there in the lower right. So please don't, rather than using the chat for, uh, for the questions, if you put them in there, we'll be able to keep track of them and make sure to get to them at the end. At the end, if we do have any, uh, if there are any outstanding questions, um, we'd be happy to try and address those in, in a follow-up email that you'll get after this session. So we're going to talk about the mobile mindset today. Mobile, I've learned to say mobile in Australia in my time here. Uh, and uh, that uh, Sarah is a senior developer and uh, a specialist in the mobile area for ThoughtWorks. She's got a long history of working in this area, both at corporations like Google or and at um, startups. And, and she, so she has experience you know, in organizations, both large and small, in creating these teams. Um, so she's going to talk to us today about different ways that you can approach this. So I guess without further ado, I will hand it over to Sarah. She's going to, she's going to give us a little poll to start out with. Uh, uh, and so it'd be great if you could fill that out. It will help her target the material, uh, to the audience. Take it away, Sarah. Hey everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into this talk. Um, as Scott mentioned, you may see on your screen uh, a little <clears throat> pop-up poll just down the bottom here. It could help me just try to tailor my talk uh, to your uh, interests, hopefully. So let's get started then. So the mobile mindset talk, I was inspired by uh, some other talks to do this. Uh, there's some big shifts in thinking to try to succeed in the mobile space. Um, Robin here is a startup founder. She's got a lot of experience in digital journalism, but she relied on app developers, a company called Aptly, to build a new app. So Robin's startup, uh, Pick Scout, great business plan. She, um, uh, just checking in on your poll, it's looking good. Uh, thank you for responding to that. Um, even though she had that background in digital journalism, um, she wanted this uh, new app that she was building, Pick Scout, which was, what it was gonna do was connect photographers with great locations. And they could share their map routes, uh, any access issues, and it would monetize as well. So she was going to use advertising for that. So I'd like you to think, uh, and some of you expressed by the poll that you were developers and others of you were more on the, the business and creative side. Please think for me, if you were on Aptly's team, how would you go about building this? It's, it's an app for a startup and they're going to connect photographers and they're going to do that uh, very entrepreneurial uh, work. Now, as a consultant myself, we always want to say it depends, right? But uh, spoiler, um, unfortunately, aptly charged Robin a six-figure sum and then the app didn't work out. It, uh, it was months late and then when Robin tested it out in her launch market of New Zealand, white screens, yeah, it just wasn't able to display the content that was promised. And I know that we all feel, well, you know, some folks are a little naive when they go into the mobile space. Robin should have done her research. But, you know, this is a real story. Robin is a real person and, you know, hopes and dreams often uh, don't, manifest the way we want them to. And unfortunately, that's especially the case with mobile. I've seen figures as high as 80%. Uh, having spent 20 years, uh, well, it'll be 20 years early next year uh, working on mobile apps, 
I can tell you that, uh, you know, big companies and small that I've worked on mobile apps, they, they, they fail even today. Um, but the answers are not uh, rocket science. There are shifts in our thinking that we can make to avoid these problems. Now, as I mentioned, I was inspired by another talk. Uh, it's also in the BioThoughtWorks series about um, micro front ends. In that talk, um, thought worker Cam Jackson talked about how to make smaller teams work efficiently by breaking front ends down. And he was using this concept of the Conway maneuver. I kind of like it. It's Conway's law. And it says that the type of app you deliver or the type of software you deliver will mirror the structure of your team. Nice, right? Because what it means is it gives us a way to fix these problems. So the approach that I'm going to uh, hopefully get you to come along on a journey with me today is making these shifts in your team's thinking, making a shift in how you put your team together, how the individual members of the team can change what they do when they set out to build their uh, development uh, processes uh, to avoid all of those mistakes as far as possible. So let me take a step back. What am I talking about when I talk about mobile? Well, I mean, you know, these things, our personal cell phones. And I know, Scott, you mentioned how that changes. Like, you know, in, in, in some countries, it's a mobile. Uh, I worked in the US for a while. Um, and, you know, over there, it's a, it's a cell phone. But this is what I mean. Folks on the go. Uh, people have cell phones close to them wherever they go now. And especially in uh, some of the most fast developing uh, nations where people have uh, very high expectations for what uh, will happen uh, in the palm of their hands. The thing about the mobile platform is that it's got some very important aspects to it. First off, it's my phone. It's personal to me. It knows all about me. It knows my contacts, uh, my location, my photos. There's things my phone knows about me that, you know, I, I wouldn't trust uh, just anyone with that information. But if I install an app on my phone, um, I expect that app to work for me. And another thing is trust. Personal and trust. Those things go together. I can do my banking on my phone. Uh, I set up my phone so that, you know, I, I have it ready to take on trusted tasks and things like my personal email, for example. Um, I also trust it to kind of do the right thing for me. So in a photography app, I don't want that app to use up all my data and spend a lot of money. Uh, I don't want it, you know, giving away my details when it doesn't need to. So those are the main two aspects, personal and trusted. And they come a lot when you build a native app. Um, companies like Google and Facebook have been working pretty hard to try to blur the line between a mobile app and a web app. So native is you know, got a, a lot of different meanings. But um, I want to say that native apps are those which can access the platform APIs of your device directly. And they're usually highly performant, uh, but they can be more difficult uh, to write. The talk I have for you today covers uh, all these different kinds of apps and the techniques and mind shifts that we need to make to get productive in that space. I keep saying mind shift. What do I mean by that? Okay, this slide is a little bit more technical, but please bear with me. Um, what I mean is the thinking has to change, especially for technical folks. We have this concept of a session. So if I connect from a web browser, I usually have a, a session that comes to me from the cloud and it doesn't apply on mobile. 
So if I connect uh, to my app right there in the palm of my hand, I might have the native app uh, spooled up from the memory of my phone and it appears here um, in front of me and it pops up potentially this dialogue during an onboarding process. So your marketing folks and your developers will tell you about this idea of a session. So on a mobile app, I, I do kind of have a session in that I'm continuing a task as I keep working to onboard myself into this brand new app. Let's say Pick Scout has been installed and I'm trying to find out if I, I want to send notifications. Do I allow them or not? Well, it turns out that when the operating system displays this dialogue, it's not actually the app that's displaying it. So we'd go through this process. And if you look at the top center of your screen, this uh, complex looking diagram, all it's really saying is that the app goes through these different stages. And by the time the operating system displays this notification about this permission, it's actually making the app inactive. So the app moves into the background whilst it's displaying that dialogue. It could even quit the whole app. So, you know, I could get a, a, a text message or chat to my friend and then switch back. So this concept of a session, it's changing all the time. So this is the kind of mindset shift. We're not in Kansas anymore. So um, a lot of the mental things that we have to hang ideas off are, are changing. But we'll talk more about that. So is this talk for you? I hope so. I hope you'll stick around. Um, if these questions apply, are you wanting to put an app into the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store? Or do you want to deliver a personalized experience, an experience that uh, you're asking your customers to trust? Or perish the thought, could you or one of your team members make the mistakes that aptly made when they built that app for Robin? Well, if yes to any of those questions, you know, please listen up and let's go on this journey to see what are these seven mind shift uh, steps that we're asking you to make. And also um, corresponding to that, who are the people involved? Well, I'm going to start here with the product owner. So this is, for my part, one of the most important things with um, a, a cell phone app the product owner has the vision for what that product market fit is going to look like. How are people going to deliver um, and receive apps uh, value in the palm of their hand by completing those, those session journeys? They're going to sit there, they're going to start something with their app, and they're going to be delighted and empowered by those journeys. Now, I've... <laughs> I've got a lot of experience building apps. I've, I've built dozens and dozens, and I've even tried my own hand at, at building them. I can't tell you what is going to make a great uh, app, but these folks, the product specialists, that's their job. And helping them are a whole team of people. The business analyst, the marketing technologist, uh, folks who interface uh, directly with the fine-grained um, analysis outputs, those, those stories and backlogs. That's your iteration manager. So that whole product side team, they are the folks who have the job of getting an entire plan for a mobile app uh, delivered out over time. And um, it's really important that those folks are engaged. I've seen a problem manifest Sometimes in uh, one particular engineering, I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but one engineering shop uh, that I worked in for a while, it was full of busy engineers and everybody, everybody kind of expected, everybody in the sort of business team looked on us all working and beavering away and they thought, well, we're going to scrape that golden stuff off of the top of whatever those engineers are producing and we're going to package it up and ship it out. And I'm sure it will be great. But the thing is, as engineers, uh, as highly um, 
intelligent as my colleagues are, we do not know what the product needs. And it can't be our job, can it? It can't be our job to, to shape the product. That has to be something that uh, the product folks are working on. And I, I've seen another mode of failure for this as well, which is where you have a product team starts things off and they get some sort of idea, but then, you know, they expect that there's these defaults. <laughs> I tell you what, on cell phones, there isn't really any kind of default. There's hundreds of ways to implement a login. And, you know, I love uh, Lily Tomlin's quote here. It's like, I wish <laughs> I would have been more specific. Um, if you just ask for a login, us engineers, we'll, we'll give you something. Uh, I can't guarantee you're going to like it. So this segues nicely into the next mobile mindset shift um, that I want to uh, bring to you, the, the idea of the, the mobile UX designer. Now, I am in awe of these folks. These are the people who can take an idea, uh, a lot of words and a lot of hand-waving, and they can turn it into something that you can visualize uh, right on the phone. They're going to get those uh, tappable mocks, the, the interactable designs where they can actually put them on a phone and see what they're like. They can take that to stakeholders. And they know how to basically put everything in a form that's ready for engineering. Um, what happens if those UX designers are not there? And it, it can happen. I've, I've seen um, projects where some of the stakeholders will be like, oh, I don't need that fancy schmancy design stuff. <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, that engineering ready uh, design is what is going to allow us engineering folks to be highly productive. Without it, we're going to be playing guesswork. And often, the things that we come up with, um, they make sense to us as engineers, but they might not make sense to your marketing folks or to your stakeholders. What I've seen happen uh, that I tells me that the, the UX is absent is when engineers are drawn into long, agonizing meetings where we're sitting there trying to sketch out our own ideas with snip, snippets of some other app and we're sticking it together like a ransom note <laughs> trying to come up with our own uh, designs let's leave that stuff to the professionals so when we do it it's way more expensive to change than it is if you get the ux folks to build it first now when i talk about product and ux i mean it that those are the most important things um, that's where it starts. And then now let's move into the engineering area. Uh, folks who are working on the front end are um, highly talented at taking those UX designs and translating them into actual functioning application code. And we can build on iOS and Android. We can utilize different systems for that. But one of the most important things, in my opinion, is that you have your uh, great UX engineers uh, provided with the phones that they are going to build on. Uh, got an Android app? Give your UX engineers Android apps, Android phones to try out their Android apps on. So that is the thing um, that is going to help them make sure that those apps are ready when they uh, get shipped. Uh, UX engineers um, have a lot of work to do in uh, trying to write tests and make sure that all the different use cases, all the different screen sizes uh, are catered for. Uh, failure modes and changes of thinking for UX. When you're on the web, you've got a whole great big screen and Little elements of that screen can change in real time. Um, you know, if you think of uh, some complex shopping apps or some big social media apps, you change a control here and it fetches some data and expands out a menu and all the rest of it. Uh, single page web apps have made us 
uh, very greedy for functionality. Suddenly it shrinks down to a cell phone size and it becomes quite difficult to really put all of that into that small uh, interface. Later, I'm going to talk more about data and back end on the phone, but let's avoid putting that complexity into the small screens that we have um, on a cell phone. All right. Now, this is my favorite part. This is my uh, main field of expertise. Back end. Now, if I'm listening, uh, <laughs> I might hear some of you saying, wait, back end on the phone? Well, yes, because um, engineering needs to happen on the device uh, for it to perform. So we can build apps that are not um, much more than a web browser. That's one way to build an app. Essentially, the app becomes like a hollow shell and all of the functionality is really on the cloud. Now, in the case of the Pick Scout app, that was a bad move because uh, Robin had told Aptly that it needed to work on the go. When folks are on their feet running about town or in the case of Pick Scout, you know, going out to locations, it needs to keep working. It needs to have the information that it had five minutes ago it needs to continue to be available. And we rely on our apps, remember? Personal and trusted. So I need to know that my app is working for me. It's not working for someone else who wants to send information to me. It needs to start working for me. It needs to know where I am and provide me with the data that I need. Now, pulling back the frame again here, um, I'm saying not a web browser. Well, what does that mean? Think about this for a moment. If you're used to a single page app, when you launch a new version of that single page app, someone browses to the website, straight away that single page app can be fetching from uh, the same APIs that match the app that you've built, right? So that's nice. But with a, with a mobile app, you've got a very different picture. You, in fact, have what I call adoption curves. So long tail mobile adoption is a big mental shift when you are implementing a back end on, on, the, uh, on the phone. So look at this vertical line here with version 1.2.1 released. So it comes out, say, 12th of March. And the numbers of people who are using it, who downloaded off the app store, that starts to climb. And then, you know, maybe a week later, it might be up to over 50% of the fleet. But there's still a whole bunch of people on these earlier versions. Look at this. We've still got like 20,000 people on the ancient uh, previous version, like maybe 1.2, 1.19. So when I explain this to folks who are new to mobile development, they're like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. We can't have people using old versions of the app. Let's force upgrade. <laughs> I don't really think it works like that. And you probably need to go and talk to your marketing people about the cost of acquisition because on mobile, it costs you 25 50 maybe even as high as $75 for each one of these thousands of users. So if I'm on the go with my app and I go to use it and bam, I get a big blocking dialogue over the top that says, you must now go to the app store and download the new version of the app. I've been quite happy with the previous one. You could have shown me a soft warning, but no, now I have to go and update. Well, I'm just going to uninstall it. We call that churn. So this is one of the big mindset shifts. We've got to remember that we're a guest on our, uh, on our users' phones. It's a very different um, kettle of fish from mobile app. All right, so how do we work? We, we can't force people. So what do we do instead? Let me introduce to something that I've been calling the best information model. And this is how 
mobile developers have been working for a while. I'm going to breeze through this pretty quickly, just through the time limitations, but we will try to make these slides available so uh, you can check this information um, later. The basic idea of best information, let's imagine we've got a very simple app. Uh, think of the very popular, um, you know, quiz type apps or um, guessing games that we've got on the internet. So Quizo comes out and I've got a hint store where I can buy new hints when I'm stuck. The static information built into the app at ship time. So the moment the app starts up, I've already got that store uh, displaying some information. So my um, users, they browse to the store. Straight away, they get an instant result. But at the same time, uh, after step one, you can see these uh, red circles. Step one, we provoke a fetch of uh, updated information. That updated information arrives and we have a new uh, data to populate our user experience. And then finally that um, appears uh, to the end user. Now, the thing about this approach is it still keeps working uh, as we introduce new versions of the app. Um, we make sure that we're running our uh, testing using these baked in versions of the information so that even when we update the app to provide increased functionality, it can still uh, cope with earlier versions that don't yet have that functionality. So this is the type of thinking that um, mobile engineers who specify, specialize in uh, engineering on the back end inside the app. This is the way we're, we're thinking about this um, uh, updates. Now, uh, for that old version, let's say I'm on the old version still, but I get a new tranche of uh, data. That uh, schema has moved forward, remember? We released a new version um, on the App Store, but this is an old user who hasn't yet updated. They're still on version 1.0.2. That's fine, their data can be dropped and we've made sure by our engineering techniques that we can cope with um, those changes. So um, how does it scale, right? Uh, how do I make this into a really big app? What if I've got multiple different use cases? It's more than just a, a toy quiz app. This is the type of structure that I recommend. And you can scale uh, best information up just by thinking about the old concept of REST. Um, we've, we've got GraphQL, which is very popular these days as well, but cast your mind back to representational state transfer. It's the idea that in the cloud, we've got our services and then we uh, synchronize with them to a repository on the device. On the device, we populate our different entities and we have a repository of those uh, entities that are framed in the problem space of our app. And uh, that's pushed up to the UX. Now we can scale this up by using an event driven uh, model so that we separate the components of the app. And it, building on this, uh, we, we can have our more complex use cases. So for example, if we need to make multiple calls out to a back end, we can build up an entity. Now, imagine someone has a, a shopping app, for example, where that particular user has some special deals. I might see my shoes, my favorite shoes on that shopping app. Hey, presto, I populate that with the thumbnails and then I get my special pricing. And each one of these API calls is building up that final product card that is going to get into my uh, model space uh, for my app. Now, once I've built that up, I can then store that away. That's the best information. That's the best information the app has. Now I'm on the go, I'm walking around town shopping for shoes. I walk under a bridge, but I pull out my app and there it is. I still have that record of what those shoes look like. I can show my friend who's walking along with me. I wanna go to this store. Now, how pleased is that store proprietor going to be that we didn't get a white screen right at that moment? 
The important thing here is that local state and best information is not the same thing as just caching API calls. It's capturing information that matters to me. It's my small window onto the whole service uh, that's provided. So looking back to Pick Scout, what they should have done, of course, and we now know this, is to use something uh, like best information. So let's imagine I'm driving, I'm a photographer, I've got the nice new version that with this new information that we all now have, uh, we've engineered it correctly and I, I pull into my uh, truck stop or whatever and I've got um, packet data or I'm on you know, my motel Wi-Fi and I'm checking my directions and everything, that's fine. I look at some reviews. But then later I'm out in the, the boondocks and um, I, I open up the app, but maybe I don't have internet now. Uh, that's fine because I've got best information. I can pull that from my local store. Uh, it might be a little bit out of date, so it's not the latest and greatest, but it's not a white screen. And the best information uh, is still better than no information at all. All right. So back end on device. Uh, I'm just going to call this out explicitly. What I mean by this is that your mobile uh, expertise um, can move from data engineering, not just on the cloud, but also on device. Now, um, this brings other benefits. It doesn't just make your app fast and uh, resistant and robust in the face of um, intermittent internet connections. It doesn't just provide you know, a, a nice, fast native result. It also helps you with scaling. So let's remember Robin. She's got her startup. What happens if um, aptly started building out loads and loads of that uh, back end that they built in the cloud? Suddenly, that's going to cost Robin a lot of money in AWS costs. Also, her team, as they add new features, it's got to be implemented in uh, the different versions of the app and also uh, in the cloud. We've got um, a problem that I see a lot, which is called uh, overfetch. I've got a very small screen here. So I do want to prefetch some data that's outside that screen. But if I've got a huge list of locations and I start fetching all of them, that's going to really trash my data plan. I'm not going to be too happy about it. It's also going to heat up my connection uh, to, to my back end data storage infrastructure. That means slow response times. It means my AWS cost is going up. So how can we avoid that problem? And you know, some of the, you know, this interim versions that are halfway on the way to, to that and the type of structure that I'm going to recommend. Um, the type of approach I would recommend, and these are not absolutes, by the way. You can sort of, you know, do something from here to here to here. Uh, this is how I built apps for 10 years. I would use the slimmest possible uh, cloud infrastructure I could. Uh, in general, I would put um, most of my data processing on the back end. So, for example, let's say you've got an app that does um, some computer vision on a uh, photograph. Now, you could do that computer vision in the cloud, but these cell phones, they now have extremely powerful silicon right on that platform that's custom tailored to doing that computer vision tasking. Now, if you do it locally, what happens? You've got data sovereignty. So if someone takes a photo of their child, for example, that's not being transmitted to some cloud service. It's being processed right there on the device. 
Um, we can still use uh, our authentication patterns, but we can use slimmed down custom versions of uh, AWS's services, such as the API gateway. That allows us to, you know, manage migration of different versions of our backends. We can splice them into a coherent API and still have a, a very slim, um, uh, but still quite agile cloud uh, as our customers come along to the scene. Um, continuing to look at uh, scaling up, um, this is one for the technical leaders in the audience. Uh, Domain-driven design is something that you can do uh, on your mobile app as well. Don't think of it as just a thin front end. This is the place where it all happens, your, your cell phone. So if you're building you know, a more commodity app on your Android device, you're gonna have a lot of Java code on there. You can divide those up into verticals and use domain-driven design, or as I like to call it, folders, <laughs> folders. Um, and that way, get all your teams working. Now, the key to having this uh, deliver for you is to make sure that your continuous integration and your continuous delivery are all set up. How do you do that? Well, uh, that's a whole extra talk, um, but uh, mobile CI and CD um, it is a thing, I promise you. You can do uh, deliveries at a push button and be continually shipping new versions of the app. So all of your uh, teams working in those uh, repositories, uh, that they uh, all have access to the latest build that demonstrates um, the contract tests. Remember our event-based uh, model with the loose coupling for those repositories? That uh, can be governed by contract tests across those boundaries. All right, let's lighten the mood. I've been pretty hard on you all. <laughs> I uh, hope you're bearing up. Um, this last one, it's a little bit more lighthearted. Um, this is something you can take away right now and you know, screenshot if you like, um, but take it with a grain of salt. I don't want to uh, police anyone's language, but these are some things that you can start changing right now about the terminology that you use in your app. So with a cell phone, we don't click a button, we tap a button. It matters for accessibility. It matters that I'm using a big fat finger and if that touch target is too small, then it's just not gonna work. So, you know, starting to use that um, thinking, that will hopefully get your folks, remember how we got our UX engineers and we gave them actual devices to use? Hopefully they're now gonna be using those devices to make sure that um, these UX elements work. And this terminology change, this will help us uh, make that shift. Looking down at the bottom of the screen, um, I st first started shipping apps um, in 2010. Uh, I worked on early Linux phones. Now, iOS was the first to pioneer the tab bar at the bottom of the screen. On Android, uh, because of the soft buttons down here, uh, your Android back button, which makes things very different on Android, they didn't really move to having a tab bar. So we've got some differences there. I prefer to use the term tab bar. Now I've laid out a few more uh, terminology items here. Um, I'll briefly mention notification. Uh, this has a specific meaning in the mobile world. A notification is an out of band uh, message that arrives on the platform over the network. On iOS, it uses Apple's uh, APNS uh, system. It's push notifications on Android. We tend to use um, Firebase cloud messaging, but it has a specific uh, meaning and it's very different from your web alerts. So again, um, just be careful of those differences. 
and um, maybe start looking at how we can shift our thinking just by virtue of the terminology that we're using. All right, let's sum up. And I know it's a lot. <laughs> I'm hoping we can share these slides with you all so you didn't have to write them down. But uh, this is your team. You've got your product and UX folks. They're there every day working with the team, embedded with them, uh, solving those UX uh, issues and making sure that us engineers aren't the ones who design uh, your login dialogue. Um, your UX folks, they're building onto real devices um, and the back end folks are working on the app. They're building a full featured app that's capable of processing data in the problem domain of your app right onto the actual uh, device itself. They're using that best information model so that they can handle uh, version drift. Remember our adoption curves? Um, they're handling that and they're putting the processing on device so that your users have data sovereignty. They have performance. They have low impact on their data plan. And your accountant is going to love you when they see that low cloud bill. And of course, you can start right away by changing up some terminology. All right, so we've gotten to questions now. So uh, let's jump into the Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That was, that was really great. I um, enjoyed that and I learned a few things as well. I think, uh, let's start with the questions. There were a couple of questions in the, um, in the Q&A box. And the first one was uh, from Elisha Lai, wants to know, what's your view of using WebView for mobile development, given that sessions don't apply in particular? Yep, thanks, Scott. And thanks, Alicia. This is a great question. Um, I worked when I was consulting uh, with a large company, well-known company in the travel space. And they had migrated from a uh, responsive web app to two separate mobile apps. And they kind of got stuck halfway and they had a lot of uh, web views. So I'm very familiar with this situation. Um, it is quite difficult to manage. Uh, in my opinion, the very best way is to create kind of separate web view for every single view that you want to actually implement in that way. So let's say, for example, you have um, an inventory list and then you have a detail for a product that someone might buy. You can create two separate web views, even though they're notionally different uh, screens because the problem you have is as soon as you display a web view and somebody starts designing that web view they can say that they're going to make it responsive but the temptation to put some tiny little link in the bottom footer that's going to take you out to say a, um, a privacy policy suddenly someone's got a web view that you didn't really control appearing right in their mobile app and you've completely lost context. So you need that web view that is in your native app. You, you're in the app store, you download the app, you open a native view and it displays a web page. How are you going to deal with someone who's getting pushed out to some other web page within that um, app? Um, they're, they're very difficult problems. Look, it can work but it's extremely difficult and it is not a time saver. You'll wind up writing a lot more code and you tend to wind up having to write a JavaScript injection, a cascading style sheet injection, uh, handlers that go backwards and forwards. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely a thing, but uh, I, I wouldn't choose it uh, if you can avoid it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so if, if I understand your, your advice, it's to keep the web views really simple 
doing one thing to manage the user experience more in your native app. Is that is that would that be fair to say? That's exactly it, Scott. You just got to constrain it and make sure there's no extra links anywhere. Um, you might have to do extra work to strip away navigation elements from the top of the screen and all that kind of stuff. Okay, we're getting some more questions. Uh, the next one is from uh, Katerina Nemish, uh, and it has a security focus. It's, uh, what's your approach for updates when there, a critical vulnerability is found in an app? Uh, can you force an update? I, I, this has always kind of troubled me as well. Yep, this is a great question, um, Katerina. Uh, I would recommend that when you're building your mobile app that you put in a hard and soft update. And you usually want to implement it uh, in a very simple way. It could be just an S3 bucket with a piece of JSON uh, in there. And you have two flags. One is the minimal accepted version, and it could be, say, 1.2.3. And then you have minimal recommended version, 1.2.8, something like that. Now, the app can fetch that when it's connected to the internet and it can check its own version. And if the app is at the uh, minimal uh, accepted version, then it's going to display a full screen blocking uh, dialogue, which forces the user to tap through to go to the app store and, and download the update. You don't want to use that. That is the nuclear option. So if you've got a big, bad security problem, people are rubbing you blind, uh, there's something that's causing a, a, a ginormous problem so that the amount of churn where you're going to lose that cost of acquisition, remember that 20 or $50 per user, if that's dwarfed by the costs of the security problem, then absolutely you want to bump that um, minimal uh, accepted version. Otherwise, you could use, if, if you've got a lesser problem, just change the recommended version and people can get just a little pop-up, a little toast that says, hey, please, uh, please update when you can. They can at least finish what they were working on and then the next time they're on Wi-Fi, they, they can go download it. Okay, thanks. Uh, next one, the next question uh, is controversial, potentially. Uh, what's your, and it brings up the, inevitably people are going to ask about progressive web apps. So what's, what's your thought about progressive web apps? And I think the, the person who's asking this question also combines that with React Native. I don't think they're necessarily the same thing, but um, is it, is that like using a web view or is it better to develop a native app, even though you have to do separate dev work for different platforms? Uh, progressive web apps are kind of the best of responsive web apps, but they're still a web app. Uh, and they work great on Android, not so great on iOS. So it depends on your market and it depends on what you're trying to achieve um, with regards to trust and uh, issues like that. So progressive web apps are great. Google would rather that you built a PWA than wrapping a lot of web views. So if your app is really just a website wrapped in a, web, in a native wrapper, Google may reject your app from the Google Play Store. It's happening. Uh, they would rather spend their time dealing with you know, nicer uh, apps. It's definitely the case on uh, iOS as well. Now, React Native, different question. That's a way of getting your JavaScript savvy engineering folks uh, up and productive, building pretty much native apps uh, without having to learn Swift or uh, Kotlin or Java or one of those languages. Uh, there are some gotchas though, because um, you need to leverage a lot of community packages. Um, it can be difficult accessing platform services and it's difficult to get the very best out of the platform, in my opinion, using React Native. Great, thank you. Um, the next one's kind of specific. <laughs> uh, what's the best practice for uh, mobile device logins? Would, would you do it natively or in the browser? Um, 
typically I've seen uh, browser-based um, work kind of the best. Uh, I would go with whatever your SaaS provider. So if you're using Auth0 or AWS's Cognito product, one of those, um, look at the integrations that they supply. Um, it can change a bit on uh, cell phones if you try to authenticate using, say, something like Facebook. It will change depending on whether or not you have Facebook's mobile app installed. So, uh, you know, look at the Facebook SDK and try out, you know, whether you want to have the pop them out to a web view or not. Um, very often, mobile um, authentication will happen in a web view, and I think it can work much better for security as well. Check with your security folks, because um, often it, it's easier for them to get what they need that way. Okay. There's an, the, the next two questions, um, in my mind at least, are kind of related. So there's a question about team structures and front-end versus back-end teams. Do you split the teams up that way? Or do you split the teams up uh, horizontally so that, that uh, you have them? Because you also mentioned domain-focused teams and the inverse Conway maneuver and things like that. And, yeah. and, and Pete Moran asks about, and this is, will inevitably come up, micro front-ends for mobile. And uh, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on those. How do you get multiple teams Co cooperating and contributing their little piece of what is a very small app to start with? Yeah, these are both great questions. Um, Nicola, your one, I, I, I hope we can share this uh, slide deck, but I recommend the team all being together uh, as far as possible. So the one team should have both their front end UX folks and their back end folks all in the same team so that when we've got a feature we can take that end-to-end -end slice all the way through with the expertise in the team uh, to deliver that slice. Uh, now if you've got cloud microservices it might be more likely that you know say the inventory service on the cloud is built by some other team but I'm talking about you know the folks who are sort of managing those transforms from the uh, cloud service calls and putting that into something that makes sense for the end user. Um, you can have a micro front end approach uh, to have those verticals replicated per team. So in fact, the team that I'm on right now is kind of using that approach. So we have a particular vertical that's working on one tab of a um, multiple tab view uh, user experience. And uh, you can do it by creating um, like event-based uh, contracts within the um, structure of the app. But look, it is difficult, uh, but I don't think it's any more difficult than it would be for uh, the same situation with uh, cloud APIs. I think it's much quicker and better to iterate when you've got the, um, the knowledge sharing of like folks with the back end experience, the data engineering right there on the device, uh, working alongside the UX folks. Thanks. Um, maybe we have time for one more. Apologies if my alert came through on the audio there while you were talking. I thought I had that turned off. Um, there, yes, the slide, we will be sending out copies of the slides and that you will, I'll say this now, um, everyone will be receiving a follow-up email. Um, we are going to put a, a um, feedback form, a place where we would love for you to go and, and give us some feedback on this talk and also let us know what talks you're interested in, in the future. And I think Grace is going to put that in the chat, a link to that, but it will also be in the follow-up email that you receive uh, after uh, it, in a few days. Um, so while that's happening, let's do one more question. Uh, Flutter versus React Native. That will only take a minute, right? 
Huge question. Look, um, there's some very good mobile developers uh, who I know personally who are using Flutter right now uh, for apps. I think it can work quite well for uh, B2B apps uh, specifically. There was a vertical there for a while that was dominated by Xamarin uh, and Xamarin Forms. They had a very nice uh, tool chain for getting apps out quickly when your product team had that C-sharp experience. Uh, and of course, um, Flutter has Google behind it. It's got the hot reload uh, type of feature. Uh, React Native also has some of those same promises. The difficulty with Flutter is you are reliant on Google um, or in the case of React Native, uh, Facebook. Um, those are large corporations, uh, you know, they are not necessarily interested in ensuring that we get our particular use case to market on time. Uh, so they will have the things supported that they want. So sometimes you'll find that, you know, with Flutter or React Native, you've got to utilize some uh, community based uh, product to get the things done that you need to get done. So, um, I would look at some of the questions that I asked in one of those earlier slides about trust and about personalization. Like if you want the app to look like it belongs on an Android phone or it belongs on an iPhone, if you want people to trust it and um, if it's very much a, a native app, in the case of PicScout, for example, you know, it needed to perform uh, quickly. You could get there with Flutter. You maybe even could get there with React Native, but it's not going to save you any work. By the time you've replicated what you have on those two different platforms, you've got a single code base for sure, but you've got if Android display this, this is a big long thing, if iOS do, you know, and you wind up with all of this spaghetti logic and it becomes kind of a nightmare. Um, so, yes, you can do it. Uh, if you want to be able to learn the special language that Google's created for that stuff, um, you know, just think about what the motivation is uh, would be my, my question there. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, there's one more question remaining, <laughs> but I don't think we have time. And it's a great question too, uh, but I think we could spend an hour answering it. So uh, hopefully we can get to that offline. Thanks everybody for giving us an hour of your time today. And please do go and fill that feedback form in. We would love to hear what you thought of the talk today. And thank you very much, Sarah. I learned a lot actually from, from listening to your talk today. So, so uh, well, well done. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone.